no further ado, we'd like to introduce our panel here. Uh, starting on the left here, we have uh, Mr. Chuck Kaiser, and he is a visiting professor at Weber State teaching business law, business ethics, and the legal aspects of contract management. Uh, next we have Ms. Jerry Muir. Uh, she is the Chief of Acquisition Oversight for the ICBM System Program Office at Hill Air Force Base. <laughs> uh, next we have Ms. Sandy Weichart, and she is a Contracting Officer and Branch Chief in the Specialized Management Contracting Division at Hill Air Force Base. <laughs> uh, next we have Ms. Christine Larinaga. And she is a currently a senior manager of contracts for ATK Aerospace Structures Division, uh, leading the commercial segment. <laughs> and next we have Ms. Ruth Sylvester. Uh, she works in both the system side and the operational side of contracting uh, as the core tool department administrator for Hill Air Force Base. And last but certainly not least, we have Mr. Craig Starnes, and he is the Vice President of Booz Allen Hamlin. Thank you. Okay, and before we get started, we'd just like to give our panel members each just a brief moment just to kind of explain to you maybe their background, uh, what kind of expertise they bring to this panel discussion, just to give you an idea of what, just hopefully you kind of get a bug in here of what kind of questions you might start formulating to ask them. Uh, start with you, Mr. Kaiser, please. I'll be brief. I'm a retired lawyer. I spent 15 years, give or take, in private practice, then managed a healthcare company where we were heavily regulated and heavily involved in government contracts. I now teach here at Weaver State. Typically, the lawyer is the guy who gets the thing when something's gone wrong. We also like to think we're involved on the front end, so we avoid things going wrong. Uh, we bracket everything that everybody else out here does. So hopefully I won't have much to say because you're all very good at what you do. <laughs> um, I'm Jerry Muir, and I came up through contracting and through the Copper Cap program. And about three years ago, I went on a uh, career broadening opportunity in program management. And I'm currently working in the Minute 9 3 program office. I'm Sandy Weigert, and I work in the Specialized Management Office in Contracting. I'm a branch chief up there, and um, I've been in contracting for over 15 years, and I also worked in the aerospace industry, um, so I kind of understand the industry side, putting the proposals together and making the last FedEx drop before <laughs> it gets there the next day at 2 in the morning, and that's about it. Good afternoon, I'm Christine Laranaka. I work for ATK, Space Systems Inc., and I have about 30 years of experience in contracts management, managing both uh, government and commercial contracts. I'm currently leading the commercial team at ATK Space Structures Division, just over here in Clearfield. So uh, working contracts with Airbus, Boeing, major other uh, OEMs. We also support many governmental programs. <coughs> Hi, I'm Maria Sylvester, and I've got over 30 years of experience in contracting here, and I'm currently the QAPC for Operational Contracting Air, uh, 75th Air Base Wing and Tenants, and then I am also the Court Tool <coughs> Department Administrator. Good afternoon, I'm Craig Starnes. I've uh, been with Booz for 23 years, been in the defense industry for uh, close to 30. Um, the areas that I focus on these days are really primarily around the, uh, the new weapons center and the uh, air logistics complexes and uh, have officer responsibilities for those particular market sectors. Okay, okay. Ben, I'd like to thank all our panel members. Uh, we'll start off with a question here. Uh, it says, what are the current efforts to simplify government contracting? I'll to expand on that a little bit. What would you like to see simplified? Uh, or what uh, efforts do you think should be undertaken to simplify government contracting, or uh, just anything that you can say on that subject? Just anyone who wants to jump in. <laughs> I guess the first thing I think, and I probably speak for a lot in this room, is uh, we've been kind of burdened. We were talking about timelines and PALT and all that. Probably the MERT 
has probably been the most painful. And then when you get up to your larger dollar, your peer reviews, and um, you know, just thinking about all the reviews you go through. So maybe getting maybe higher thresholds for MERT would probably be something that I would like to see myself because um, they're rather painful. <laughs> I guess from an industry perspective, um, it just the clarity around specific requirements is something we always struggle with. There is uh, the ability to respond in, in a lot of ways, especially these days with uh, many of the solicitations geared towards small businesses or, or low price technically acceptable types of offerings. How do you really respond to what you're looking for based on some of the specifics in the, in, in the requirements, PWS, SOW, whatever it may be, seems to be a little bit broad and, um, you know, at, at times a, a, a challenge to really fit the scope with what sort of a contract mechanism you're looking to do. Yeah, and I think I would add on to that, that that is really one of the things that, uh, as an industry representative, we struggle with quite frequently, is truly understanding the requirements and the statement of work and the other elements. And so all of that timing of engagement that we just spoke about and having someone involved earlier in the process to make sure that we're really sharing clear uh, information and there's some term transparency in those requirements, I think it makes it go much faster and I think you get a better product. Thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, the next question we have here, um, are there any opportunities for frontline contracting personnel to improve the process they work within a day-to-day -day basis? So I guess change over from the, the bottom up, so to speak, what kind of opportunities for change do you see there? Um, from having worked as a, as a branch chief in contracting and then transitioning a couple years ago over to the branch chief of program managers, I think that there is a really big opportunity for things to be changed from the bottoms up. Um, and I know that we talk top level a lot about upfront involvement and we coin terms a lot of times that we don't have a specific document or a process where we tie that in. And I think that at the working level, that's a great place to have that dialogue. And the example I'll give you is, um, Instead of being transactional, contracting-wise, which is unfortunately, I will tell you, that's the way program managers may view you a little bit in contracting, and, and in general, is that contracting is a transaction, and unfortunately, they view finance the same way. And I would tell you, you have an opportunity to engage and say, hey, I know that you're putting together your execution plan for FY15, I know, and it's due. It's due every July, August. They have to say how every dollar is going to go it's a really good opportunity if you're working with an IPT to say, hey, can I see your execution plan? Because we're going to rock it. I want to I wanna know where we can execute. I'm going to identify risks to you. We're going to put together a plan, and we're going we're gonna to get this done. And um, I'm lucky that my program folks have had contracting folks that have done that. And I will tell you, not only does it give an advanced view to contracting, but it also changes the mindset of the PM when they come back and say, you know, my contracting person told me I had to put unfunded options on this one. You know, I should price them out so I don't have to get three proposals. And it sounds silly to you because that just makes sense, but your PMs are so much in just trying to get by and trying to put out fires that some of those things are going to be lost on them. And so if you find out what they want to do three or four months from now, you might see an opportunity that they're going to miss. So I say, yeah, there's a big opportunity for early upfront PK involvement at the ground level to drive efficiencies. Uh, since the title of this, this forum is supposed to be cooperation amongst the, uh, the different factors here, the CEO, the PM, the, the core, and the contractor, uh, what kind of uh, efficiencies there do you think we can drive uh, through cooperating together, and what, what are we not now doing that we should be doing in that, in that aspect? Any thoughts? I guess um, kind of building on General Masiello's point earlier about the, the, having the engagement with industry early and often, I think is something that we really want to continue to, to, to see happen. I think that really helps you get a better product 
from the expectation perspective as to what you're looking for, but it also helps industry drive towards what, what really the goal of the end state of that particular uh, requirement is. Um, I, I think one of the, one of the keys, um, and I don't want to embarrass you too much, but one of, the, one of the keys that contributes to success in this is really the transparency and the open dialogue and discussion that we have with our uh, contracting uh, officials as an industry representative. Um, Ms. Marshall, amongst others, is extraordinarily uh, open to hear the types of uh, issues, challenges, problems that we sh uh, share as uh, both you know, a prospective client or a current client in trying to help the mission evolve. So I think just the transparency of the discussions and making sure that you're actually um, dialoguing openly with industry certainly helps uh, some of these kind of challenges down the road. I think if I could just add on one more thing to that, and it's a, the whole concept of forecasting. Sometimes we think about forecasting just in terms of the existing contracts. But really, I think if you're uh, working together, industry uh, will be able to help you look at their forecasts. And you can ask them things such as, you know, what are your capital expenditure forecasts? What are your... Um, technology roadmaps that you're working to right now that maybe we could use in future opportunities. So I think the more we do dialogue with one another, share forecasts, share future <coughs> desires, uh, it's going to um, innovate and it's going to help us find new ways to work together. The last thing anybody wants is surprises. The last thing anybody wants is problems that come out of nowhere. And sooner or later, that problem started small. And by the time it was discovered or communicated, if you wait long enough, it became bigger than it needed to be. So I would absolutely say that the communication aspect and the dialogue that we're all mentioning up here is key to smoothing out the process. And then um, I'll, just, I'll just piggyback on all of that, too. With, we had, so the president's budget went over to the, to the Congress last week. So as far as it drives a whole lot of questions about are, are these dollars executable? Can you really use them? Should we just pull them? Should we take them? So I'm kind of the new kid on the block at the office and they're like, yeah, it's kind of an FM thing, but we want you to look at these schedules and just tell us if we're, if we're executable to get these things on contract or over to the depot in time to, to use that money like we said we did. There, no, they, we have some issues. We have some challenges. like whole years separated so kind of sat down kind of sat down with the pms and we said okay so when we palmed for this money like what, what was your cost estimate based on and you know what kind of market research did you do and like one of them they're like well i was i had four hours to put my chart together to say what i needed and so i did the best that i could with my one engineer and me and so this you know we had some problems and so Taking that back and having lessons learned like that, we realized, okay, so what we, it's no surprise what we need in FY17. It's not, I'm, I know my engineers know that. They know it. I, engineering, just, I don't know if you know engineering, but they're not just working one day in advance. Those guys are crunching numbers and they're like building graphs and charts. And so we kind of, we said, okay, so what are our 17 risks coming out of our risk management board out of the engineering community? What are my big rocks? And so today, out of, out of the directorate level, they pushed a call and said, hey, for uh, FY16 and 17, these are our programs coming. Within the next six months, we need you to post market research. We need to know how long your engineering manufacturing development phase is going to be. We need to know, um, are they going to rehost software? Are they not? We need to know your overall, not like a firm acquisition strategy, but we need to start asking those questions because industry can give us a lot better answers if we ask them early. And then we get a better cost estimate, we have a better schedule estimate, and then we put our palm in. Right now, the poor PMs are they're doing all that stuff after they've been told what money they're going to get and in what year. So the PMs are trying to put a square peg into a circle hole, and that's why there's a lot of frustration. And so I, I think a lot of this, too, is not creating new meetings. It's not creating a new forum. It's not... We just need better dialogue. We need to keep the engineering process, talking to the program process, talking to the finance process, and talking to the, the poor people in contracting that are going to receive this stuff at the end of the at the end of the, the game. And that's what we need. And we need like branch chief level, we need lead level, we need folks to make common sense questions and say, What what are you guys getting out of risk? 
And yeah, they'll look at you and say, well, contracting, what are you doing asking me about my risk? And I know there's program folks out here. You should share your risk stuff with contracting. You should absolutely share it with them. They have great ideas. And, you know, we, we can get really good ideas from industry about ways to make my class more affordable, like, like General Masiello talked about. So I think we need to kind of just figure out what everybody's already doing and just let's all make these processes talk to each other. Thank you. We have another question that came up. It's after contract award, what are some of the uh, problems you face in getting started on contract performance? Uh, from the government's view, from the contractor's view, and do you have suggestions on how to solve these problems? Well, I guess um, probably when, when, when you award the contract, the best thing to do is you know have some post-award orientation and work, but it depends on if you're awarding to a new contractor um, and you have some transition that can make it a little more challenging. But I think um, engaging as soon as, you know, as possible with the successor contract, if that's the case, to make sure you go through all the terms and conditions, everybody understands the contract. And even before getting to that point, one thing I always try to do is always post a draft RFP so that everybody in industry sees it more than once. So not only your final RFP, and then they, um, can give you feedback on it and you can have a better product and then hopefully a better contract that makes more sense um, down the road. Well, of course, coming from the QAPC, what else am I going to say, but you need to get your cores trained and ready to be able to work when the contract is awarded. And yeah, there's problems with that program but we need to work through it. It is mandatory, so we don't have any choices. And, but, uh, but even headquarters in AFMC, or AFMC and SAF and OSD are trying hard to iron out a lot of the bugs. One of the things that we try to do, uh, just as a new engagement is getting kicked off, is you know, obviously marry that up with what the, the proposed solution or uh, objective was of the drill to start with. But also look at you know maintaining the, the relationship management between the various stakeholders here. So it's not just you know the technical team and the PM. It's actually working with our contracts and the, 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 the government contracts. It's working with the quality folks on our side with the delivery technical side as well. So I think it's it, it kind of is multifaceted um, and, and things like PMRs and things of that nature really help drive to uh, some, some kind of, uh, I guess, standardization across these types of uh, uh, deliveries and, and transition of contracts. But I think, um, you know, the, the key thing that we keep talking about, and it's, um, it, it clearly is a, is a huge component of the things that we do, is just the dialogue and communication across the stakeholders, not just the, the, the in-state client, but also the folks that are uh, representative across the contract side as well. So I think one of the uh, most effective tools is really to have a joint kickoff meeting where you have uh, traditionally our programs are major contracts, there's developmental activity going on with them, it's major systems, major structures. Uh, the customer or the uh, government, depending on if, what, what tier we're performing at, they have an IPT, we have an IPT. I like to bring the IPTs together and as part of that kickoff meeting, we do some peer mapping to say, who is my peer? Who should I be speaking to? And then I like to have a cadence of uh, weekly meetings. Maybe they're executive meetings followed by working level meetings. They are in conjunction with, and they don't replace the, the PMRs and the other you know, ongoing activities. But it's really all about fostering the understanding and that collaboration, that communication, because that is really where you're either going to succeed or fail. Thank you. Uh, just in case I didn't make it clear before, uh, if you write down a question, you have something, please pass it to the end of the row so we can come grab that from you and get to all these questions that we can here. Uh, next question we have coming for the audience uh, has to do with requirements. The government has a difficult time developing them. Uh, this is more towards uh, industry, but we would be interested in hearing, of course, any government inside of this. 
Does industry prefer to respond to a PWS or would they rather respond to a SUE with a CSAP? And just kind of your perspectives on that. You can go ahead and go first. I, I think that means neither one of us know the answer to it, right? <laughs> right. Um, I, I, I guess, uh, me personally, I kind of like the PWS uh, elements probably just, just a bit more, but um, you know, it's all relative. It's all kind of what specific requirements are and what's, you know, what the SU states and um, what you're actually looking to, to get accomplished. Uh, you know, it gets back to, you know, if you want a, a really uh, in-state product or solution that is based on a series of requirements, Clearly, the better uh, requirements that you write, however that you write them, are going to be uh, helpful to industry to give you the right answer. So I, I don't know. Uh, my IT colleague might have a different opinion here. Well, I was really going to give the proverbial. It depends. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it, it really is based on you know what is it that the contracting opportunity is about, and I like uh, the fact that we are using draft RFPs and we're getting information out and we're actually building a better RFP so that we can be more responsive, so that the understanding is better between the parties. And then it will make sense as we go through that process together. What do I really need to provide so that you can uh, bid it well and so that I know that the performance will get done? Uh, I also think it's really important and I wanted to just piggyback on the risk comment. The more the risk is shared, the more there's an understanding of that, it's going to help drive uh, not just the cost, but those cost mitigation and cost avoidance techniques that both parties can engage in. So if we're open and transparent about risk and we understand, hey, you know, th because there's so much risk at this early stage of the development, maybe we're going to do a, a different contracting type, a cost contracting type. But over the course of time, we're going to move to a fixed price contract type. We can dialogue about that and talk about the milestones that relate to that developmental process and what might be the right time to make those transitions. Thank you. We have another question that came up. It's uh, it has a couple of parts to it. It says, in your opinion, what is the primary benefit of court? How well do you think the court is fulfilling its purpose? And what would you like the government and industry to do to improve court? OK. <laughs> court tool has a lot of issues. We all know that. Um, the biggest problem with court tool is that it is not just for the Air Force. It is for DOD-Y. So what happens is that any time we try to make a change, all of the higher level, SAP type level um, points of contact for that have to agree to it across all of the agencies. That is almost impossible to get everybody to agree to a change. So that's part of the problem. I, I think the other part of the problem was that when, um, when they contracted this to be developed for the new program under WAF, the contractor wasn't allowed to see any of the programming that went into the, to the Army one, and yet they were supposed to create it as a mirror image. It makes it a little difficult when you don't know what is in there and how it works. Is it a good tool? I think in re I think in theory it's an excellent tool, and I really liked it when it was under the Army program because it seemed to be easy to use. This one, the current one, is a little more cumbersome and um, has a lot of things that needs to be repaired. The problem is, is it's a fix something, one thing, it's causing problems with other aspects. So we're still just running into. I think it's going to take another year or two years before it stops morphing and, and we actually have a, a really good workable program. As for the cores, yeah, they're valuable. They need to be there. They're, they're, they're there to help to ensure that the contract's being done properly and that we're getting the service that we paid for. We can't be everywhere and they need to know what, the, what their parameters are for being able to deal with the contract and the contractor. So, in reality, it's a good thing, and the reason that we went to court instead of being under the QAP is because I don't believe it would ever happen here at Hill. Um, 
but at many of the other bases, the Corps were doing, the QAPs were not doing anything. They weren't doing any inspections, doing any of their job, and contracting wasn't uh, reviewing any of the information, and they had no clue that, that the, the, the service wasn't being um, inspected. So they, they said, we need to change this, and we're going to enforce, make it forcible, and that's part of the reason for the court tool is now contracting has to go in and has to approve or disapprove the, the Corps' inspections. Thank you. Sorry. Next question is, as we seek better communication, greater efficiencies, and clarity of requirements, can you share one of your division's greatest successes and, and or a lesson learned? Um, my, I think we're going to have feedback oh. with that one in the next. Oh. Sorry. Sorry. That's okay. Um, I think, so I, last year I sat down with my, with my branch and, you know, we noticed that our cost estimates, I know you all in contracting are going to be surprised, some of our cost estimates were a little off. <laughs> I know. <coughs> You're all shocked. No, we, we just, we had, a, we had a problem with our cost estimates being just completely either way too high or way too low and they drive thresholds and clauses and, you know, and all that good stuff. And, so we brought one of our cost estimators up, and if you don't know there's a difference between budget and cost, learn the difference, because it will totally help you. So we bring, our that we bring our cost estimator up, and he runs us through some of our cost estimates, and he says, well, you know, the, the biggest problem I have is um, your engineers are spread way too thin. They're, I'm not getting good information on the requirements about exactly what parameters engineering-wise you need out of the system, what all the interfaces are, so we do our best with your PM, but we make some faulty assumptions, and lo and behold, faulty assumptions drive schedules berserk and cost berserk, right? So we sit down like as a, with our team, and I had a really sharp GS13 um, lead on the program side, and I said, okay, you guys, I can't bring you more engineers. Um, you know, I mean, we're on a hiring freeze, and so, hey, it's really good to hear that I can't fix your engineering problem, but I said so. But we can't live with cost estimates. We're going into a budget process. We gotta have better cost estimates for our budget guys. So the 13 says, okay, if I can't, if I can't get more engineers on my side of the house, then I'm gonna leverage industry. I'm like, okay, Greg, how are we gonna leverage industry? And he said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do market research. And he said, they better get ready because I'm going to ask them all kinds of questions. So he sat down with his cost estimator and said, what do you need to know? What are your key drivers? Then he went through the engineering review board process and said, what are your worries? What are your concerns? And he wrote all of those down. You know, and then we had a stellar contracting person who's actually sitting over there. We'd love to know me, Thomas. And so they sit down and they come up with all these questions about their, their program and stuff. And they posted a 22-page draft requirement document. They posted like 10 or 15 specific questions from across their IPT, and it wholesale changed the approach of that contract. And I don't have an engineer on that program. I have an engineer split across three, but now I have information that when I do get that valuable time with my engineer, I can ask them questions. And it's been really, it was a really good thing, and that all came from a section lead saying, okay, my costs are kind of stinky. How can I work with what I've got in order to, to leverage that? And it really worked well. And industry really had some inputs that really changed our assumptions. And when we took those assumptions back to our engineering board, they said, yeah, that's totally doable. We're totally comfortable with that. That's, that makes sense. So I would tell you, um, these processes are not, they don't stand alone. And nobody's going to drive a, a tasker to you to tell you to sit down and run this by people. We need business advisors, we need financial advisors, and we need PMs that see across the, the whole gamut. And we need to, we're not gonna get more people, our budgets are gonna be scant, so we better make sure that whatever we're doing is cross-feeding and we're talking. And that was one where our cost estimate changed and my execution strategy totally changed because of, at the IPT level, they all talked. Yeah, I guess, um, interesting that uh, a couple of these themes come around cost estimating. Um, it was interesting back in, uh, it's been a few years ago, we, were, we had a, a NASA job that we were working in. I was in the NASA market at the time. And um, I had this young engineer that, uh, um, it, you know, he got really frustrated. He had this like thousand pound brain. 
and there was uh, there was some sort of cost estimate that he had to come up with. So he was using some sort of Cox product or whatever, and so he ended up um, kind of. Uh, he basically, the story he told me, and I'm not quite sure if he had lived this a little bit or not, but that, knowing him, he probably didn't, was he actually took um, some vacation, and he got a couple of his buddies from his uh, grad school program, and they got in their basement, and they actually, for like a week, and he said there's pizza boxes, and there's all kinds of stuff all over the place, um, and they, they figured out this really um, high-end algorithm that could get to uh, a cost baseline that, um, you know, with and it could do it in about a fraction of a sec uh, in seconds in the same sort of uh, calculation for some of these NASA types of jobs that had taken uh, you know days to run some of these uh, different sorts of scenarios and so um, you know coming full circle he comes back and he you know gets all excited about this model um, it ended up being a, a model that uh, saved NASA a tremendous amount of work and it was efficiencies because they went back and they talked to the client, they talked to, to, to the customers, they talked to the contracts folks, and they actually now, they even had to go to, to uh, uh, brief this, this particular program on uh, Capitol Hill about, you know, it was in that dire straits, but with the ability to get, you know, this kind of creative juices of this one individual, they actually were able to, to kind of get the program turned around and get, um, you know, some realistic and, uh, and reality-based cost estimates that gave this program a secure future for, for many years. I mean, it was, I thought it was kind of innovative that he actually took the time to think through this, but the fact that it saved both us from an execution, but it also was a, a, certainly a huge benefit for the, industry, for the uh, government client and the end state was uh, rewarding as well. Thank you. Uh, next question we has has to do with the eternal conflict of CO versus PM. We have a cat and dog relationship here, I will say which is which. Uh, it says, how does the CO get the PM to understand that contracting isn't an impediment? And I guess just kind of the inherent conflict between uh, getting the requirement on, uh, you know, getting the warfighter or the customer what they need, and the people trying to make sure that it's done by the rules, by the law, and that's something that you see in industry as well. Uh, yeah, we definitely see that in industry. Um, one of my favorite stories to tell is uh, that at one point in a negotiation, somebody said, well, you know, stop, we better go get Christine and make sure that she's involved in this. And, and the PM's response was, oh, dear God, how long do you want to, this to take? <laughs> I said, you guys, I'm just going to come in and ask some good questions. You know, but I think that... Uh, there really is that inherent sometimes conflict is, is the way we might think about it. The way that I prefer to think about it is that contracts management and uh, COs or contracts managers, they really need to be partners. And, and we should really look at ourselves as partnering together. We're, we're going to build the strength of a program together. And so while one of us may have uh, a view for compliance, a view for making sure that we are doing the right thing, while the other one wants to be innovative and moving quickly, I think respecting one another's roles and responsibilities and understanding the value that you each bring to the program uh, is what will really get you over those hurdles. I was just gonna say, I think it's really important that us as CEOs in contracting, that we just keep in mind that we should never tell our customer no, we should tell them how. Because there's always one way to get there, <clears throat> more than one way to get there. And I always encourage the program folks to come to us early, engage early, engage often. Because just feeding off of what General Masiello said earlier, you may be off as a program manager trying to solve the world's problems and getting all flustered about it and not knowing there may be an easier way to get there if we just communicate from a program and contracting standpoint. So I think that's one of the keys. And, and again, um, just being flexible and, and making sure that you communicate often with your customers so that they don't look at us as barriers. You know, if you're always just in there, um, you know, saying, no, you can't do that, there's no way I can get that done, and you don't offer solutions as a, as a business advisor, that's really not conducive to a, a, a good, healthy working relationship with your customers. Yeah, I, 
I think um, just just a little bit of a different twist. One of the things that we may end up uh, trying to facilitate when we see circumstances like that is actually how can we uh, pull together the stakeholders in terms of you know whether it's the PM or the contracts. There there may be a conflict as to what particular you know issue is at hand and almost you know bring the the attention to both folks at the same time you know kind of it's almost like you know how do we facilitate some sort of better understanding because the rule in more more times than not they look at things through two different lenses and how can we as you know the folks that are actually on the execution side of it Really help merge those two, and I, I think sometimes it's uh, it's helpful that industry gets and you know, ha has some ability to engage there as well. I mean, actually, I laughed because I thought the same thing. I thought there's 20 of us across Hill Air Force Base. I think I'm the only one in contracting, and all the rest from our program side. We get talking, and even though we're talking, at the, you know, the core program or or QAPC issues, I still get. <coughs> Okay, we don't understand you. You're talking contracting ease again. So it doesn't matter which area you're in. We we have to really make sure that we're that we are expressing it in a way that they're understanding it, and vice versa, because we do talk a little bit of different terminology as we're going through this process, and that makes it more difficult. You know, the question um, used the term versus CO versus PM. Uh, Let's give it a lawyer to talk about it. Yeah, it's a big V we see in all cases. And I would have put him on my lawyer hat for a second. No one likes to be told you can't do that. Exactly. And if you don't get involvement in the initial stages, somebody's going to have gotten way down the road, whether the PM or not, and decided this is what we must do. You take to the CO, CO says, well, that's the one thing you can't do. <laughs> Go back to the drawing board. How many people in here have been sent back to the drawing board when they come back with yet another proposal and said, no, you can't do that? Isn't it easier if you just work through it together so you're working not at cross purposes? And it gets back to what we said, whether it's communication or collaboration, it can't be an adversarial relationship because that will only exacerbate the problem. You have to have the buy-in from both sides early on Saves time, saves effort, saves frustration, and it saves this versus type of mentality. It really does. As, as a lawyer, in a regulatory environment, I can't tell you the type of people have said, well, we got this great idea. What if we just did this? And I said, yeah, that violates my four government regulations. We'll be in jail. <laughs> Sounds great, but the government says you can't do it that way. So let's get together and figure out a way you can do it instead of me just having to be Dr. No. No, 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 no. And then I'm the bad guy. Don't like to be the bad guy. Lawyers, sometimes we thought it was bad guys, it was a shot. We don't like to be that. So get it in and get it together earlier and avoid that problem. Um, I think the only thing I would add is first of all, there's two people that keep program managers out of stripes in Orange, and it's your contracting officer and your legal advisor. So um, I'd say that. But I, there's been a lot of good things said, and um, as far as like partnerships and stuff, I know that. With my program managers in my branch, I had to work really hard to say, um, and this seems like kind of trivial, but I said, when you bring up that contracting has a problem, no, your IPT, we have a problem. We have a challenge. And just replacing like terms like that, it sounds silly, but when we use words like us and them about challenges that we're facing in acquisition, it reflects that there is a dividing line and I don't have ownership of what's going on over there. It's being done to me, not with me. So I, I really want to emphasize that how we think about, and it is all about relationships. This is not about transactions. It's, it, it is relationships. And if you are an integrated product team, it is a we problem. So if you're using, or your PMs are using us and they, you don't have to have a big soapbox dialogue, but say, yeah, it sounds like we have a problem, and I'm going to help us get better. So I would say look at that, and then I told my PMs, um, you know, I, I told them, I really feel really strongly that this is an IPT acquisition, and there's different stages in that, but I said, I feel really strongly that if you go to clearance as a team, you will be a team. I expect my PMs to go to business clearance and to contract clearance, and I expect them to be sitting shoulder to shoulder <coughs> with their buyer and their PCO. They need to be there. Now, I didn't know all the time when those things happened, 
And they said, well, that's contract now. I'm over the fence. I contract it. It's like a Coke machine. I feed them my PR. I push a little button and the contract spits out the bottom. No, get into the Coke machine. And so I just let them know. I, they're like, this is, and I had one of them say, I don't, I don't have time to go to that. I'm like, it's going to be an hour. And if you don't go, your PCO is going to be asked technical questions. They guess where those are going to come. Because contracting is not going to answer them. You're going to get an email, and you're going to get a list of things to do, and it'll take you longer than your one hour's worth of time to resolve them. So why don't you just go, hear the questions that are being asked, be a team, answer the questions, and it'll save you time in the end. And then the second thing I would say on the flip side, when I go to a program management review, um, I can tell my good contracting people because they're in the room, and they don't need a special invite to be there. And I'll tell you, we had a meeting last week with our, P, with our PEO. He came up. And I thought this was the best endorsement of contracting and the things that are being done on these IPTs when there was a key question that came out that was an engineering question. And the branch chief walked over to the chief of engineering and said, where's engineer so-and-so? This is the third time the issue's been raised. Why isn't he here? Well, uh, you know, he's kind of, did you guys invite him? And he looked straight out and said, I didn't invite PK, they're all over there. I didn't invite FM, they're all over there. Do I have to give your guy a special invite to be a member of my team? So I would just tell you that working together means that you are together. If there's a program review, you go. You support it. If you're in program management and there's a business clearance, you go and you support it because you're a team. So we gotta get out of this like, like language about, we gotta walk our talk, I guess is what I'm saying. And that means you have to look at the way you're acting as an IPT and is it a we or is it a us and they, or me and them? Thank you. Next question, it says, how does the industry feel about RFIs, source of stocks, uh, draft RFPs, and the extent of how time consuming they are on these? Uh, let's see, I, I think the, um, <laughs> The short answer is getting more clarity and more information out to make the official requirement um, something that you're comfortable responding to is helpful to everybody. Um, you know, RFIs definitely, uh, you know, have a sense of, okay, this isn't a real proposal, but let's get, you know, kind of tee up some of the issues, some of the constraints, some of the challenges that we see and maybe even you know put some thought into uh, the responses that will um, kind of lend themselves to solutions that uh, perhaps they weren't necessarily thinking of before. So I, I think um, just by and large, if I'm thinking RFIs or any sort of draft RFPs, it's it's industry's way without giving away the farm as to actually coming up with some ideas, some uh, requirements that will help make the, 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 the final product, the final uh, uh, RFP, much more um, effective in terms of you know, what the ultimate product is. Yeah, I agree very much with that. And then I would just say that there is a, a kind of downside or a flip side to this whole process is uh, just like the government industry is very budget driven. And so we have a limited budget and to have repetitive or iterations that aren't really value added is, is not helpful to either side of, of the uh, coin. And so the more time that is spent in preparation, it's gonna save a lot of time and a lot of money over the course of the program. So before the draft RFI goes out or the draft uh, requirements go out, even then it's still okay to talk to each other and make sure that something is getting put together that's gonna be able to be responded to and is worth the investment that the uh, various suppliers are, are going to make in that response. I've seen cases litigated, contracts litigated over two ambiguous terms in a 20 page okay. document. Um, if you want to avoid that, and that's very costly, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's damages, relationships, etc. then it helps to have the clarity with draft RFPs or fully understood RFPs before the contract is ever signed. So, Despite the fact that it does take a little bit of upfront effort and a little extra money, it's far cheaper than litigating and having bad results later. So yeah, I think it's very valuable. True. Thank you. Uh, our next question here uh, has to do with uh, kind of the title again, uh, contract performance. 
um, in that how do we get from a well-executed contract, or how do we get to a well-awarded contract to a well-executed contract? Um, a lot of times, a lot of our initial, a lot of our emphasis happens to be with uh, getting the contract on, getting it awarded, but then we don't really pay a lot of attention to how it's how it's managed, how it's executed. So, kind of the thoughts on transitioning from uh, contract uh, award to contract execution. Well, I guess um, one of the things that is has changed over time with with our particular firm is you know we go a great lengths to celebrate contract awards you know and it's like we we have uh, you know we spend a lot of time on capture we get really excited about the wins and um, you know I, I think the industry at large really the reason that they're in the position that they are is usually the success of what they're actually delivering. And so um, we started really probably, you know, it's always been, quality's always been one of our 10 core values, but um, we started really looking at the ability to, re uh, to recognize success and delivery just as much as success in contract awards. And so we do uh, a lot of um, kind of quality reviews and we have a corporate level of uh, reviews on most all contracts. Uh, that really emphasize, you know, the, the secret to success of being around for a while is having the same customers come back to you. Uh, and, you know, and I think at the end of the day, celebrating delivery execution to the same extent that we celebrate contract award success has given us a lot of, uh, a lot of lift with our, our, our delivery teams. I would just maybe uh, add too that in, in addition to celebrating the common successes throughout the lifetime or the life cycle of the program, it's really important that at the beginning we pick metrics together that make sense. And so I uh, was in a session earlier today where we talked about the importance of choosing the right metrics. Just because we can measure something doesn't necessarily mean that that's really going to be the, the metric or the set of metrics that help us perform well. So coming up with objectives and metrics that we can use, adjusting those and being adaptive and flexible over the life cycle of the program to say, you know, we used to measure that, but now it's more important that we measure this. And then again, really celebrating those successes. I think it's important to communicate the expectations to the team of people that will be in charge of performing the contract versus just the people that were in charge of capturing and, and getting the contract in the first place. Um, I'll keep it gender neutral, but would you please take out the trash? And you say, sure, I'll get to that. And 20 minutes later, it's, honey, I thought you said you were going to take out the trash. Oh, yeah, I'm still working on it. And about the fourth time you get reminded, that person probably says, you know, fine, that four letter up word, I'll take out the trash myself. And it did get done, it was performed. You'll be paying for it for quite some time and lost <laughs> relationships, et cetera. And I know that sounds incredibly simple, but it's the Nike version of contracting. Just do it. There are goals that are in your contracts. There are, there are benchmarks. You have to meet them. And getting back, if you're not going to meet them, you better have some very good reasons. And it can't be, well, they're doing this, or you go to your superior and say, well, the other side is... You have to have solutions to address why they're not getting done, but the smoothest performing contracts are the ones that actually get done. That's incredibly, again, very simple, but that's where you have to go with this. That has to be your, your, your baseline expectation is we're gonna get it done on time, at budget, and if we're gonna have problems, they can't be surprises. You'll avoid all kinds of down the road, downstream problems if you just do it. As simple as that sounds. Next question. How is industry aligned in terms of what types of cross-functional dialogue occurs? And a, a person who posed the question also said that they feel the government is compartmentalized and from my, my perspective, not as collaborative. Well, I think if I'm understanding the question correctly, uh, we do have integrated product teams. Uh, most of the major um, corporations within the industry, the aerospace industry in particular, uses the integrated product team. Many of the corporations uh, or companies use um, that structure 
on every single program that they have. There are others that may have an integrated product team just for major uh, developmental activities, uh, which is something that I think the IPT is such a helpful way to align your teams and make sure that they have someone across the board or on the other side who uh, is their peer and that they've been mapped to so that we can really be very functional and we can be uh, dynamic. I guess, um, you know, we're organized internally in a really market-facing type of organization. And uh, one of the things uh, that we really do, and I think we do pretty effectively, is do some of these cross-cut initiatives. Uh, so we share, um, you know, in open forums at least once a month across the leadership teams of various, whether it be an Air Force team or an Army team or, a, um, you know, a, an intelligence community team just the same sorts of concepts that are challenges or issues that you see perhaps uh, that come up in the Air Force. How can we leverage something that perhaps um, the Army team has gone through already through another <coughs> contract that uh, they've got some history with. So it is uh, intentional the way that we have kind of organized from a service perspective of looking at the, the ability to be agile and answer the questions that in one market that you know, maybe we're not asked to do that today, but at some point down the road, um, you know, more times than not, that same sort of skill set or capability or product or um, you know challenge that a client may have uh, is it transcends whatever market area that you're in. So the ability to to kind of share those types of ideas, functional ideas, functional community types of things, I think uh, it certainly helps us. The good news is you're not alone. The bad news is, you're not alone. Uh, all industry, the bigger you get, the easier it is to silo off and protect your own turf and focus very narrowly on what it is you have to get done. Um, it happens across all industries. Healthcare is, is just massive at that. But if you can identify the stakeholders, and we've used that term quite a bit up here, who might have an interest in what you're doing that are outside of your very z small zone of influence, and you can see how what you're doing might affect the stakeholder and who else might have a similar effect on that stakeholder early on, you'll start to break down some of those silos and you will get some cross-functional dialogue. But it has to be done that way. It's not going to be done from a broad institutional edict. That, that, that's, we can say it all day long and that's not going to cure it. It has to be done almost from the bottom up, a grassroots thing, and it has to be done early. And I would just say um, the grassroots people will have a lot better um, opportunity to do that if we have first-line supervisors and mid-level managers identifying opportunities to do that. And I would, I would tell you because people will talk. People will generally, people at the working level are friendly. They want to collaborate. They have the intention to do that. But unless somebody who can see things with a little bit broader of a scope outside of one little IPT, if they can see where that IPT's efforts fit into a process of requirements generation or risk analysis or execution plan, then they can say to their folks, hey, why don't you go ask your PM for his execution plan? Did you know that they have a key risk they need to mitigate in 17? You have to talk to them about it. So if you're a first-line supervisor, um, you have a really, really big opportunity because by the time you get to second-line supervisor or third, sometimes you lose track of the, the, where the rubber hits the road on the process, where the touch points are. And so I think first-line supervisors have a really big opportunity, and leads too, I think leads really do too, to, to be able to say, I think we should ask this question. Let's see what it does. And, and I do think that it needs to come from the bottom up. So. I was just going to say one thing on top of that. The one thing that frustrates me the most is if you ask somebody if they followed up on something and you get, well, I sent an email a week ago and I haven't heard from them. That seems to be the mode of communication. So I think if we're going to try to become more collaborative, we need to just get away from just slinging an email and thinking that you've contacted that person. You know, follow up, follow up. You know, if you have to, heaven forbid, get up out of your chair and walk to their desk, um, you know. The old ways of communication, it might be more productive. No call center people will call me six times a day until they get a hold of me. Why can't you? <laughs> this is more. This is your job. So let's let's again it's the just do it mentality. But you know, don't tell me you, you left three voicemails. That's not getting it done. What are you going to do other than leave voicemails? Because three times you're out. You strike three. 
what's your next thing? Because if I have to do it, I don't need you, and now we've got a different problem, right? <laughs> right there we go, thanks. Okay. okay, with that, I think we'll have to wrap up. Uh, we'd like to apologize. We did have a lot of great questions we unfortunately weren't able to get to for time. Uh, we'd like to give our panel one more round of applause. Thank you.